Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Well, it's really nice to see you all here today. And I will tell you, for me personally, this is an extraordinary treat to be able to share the afternoon with you guys, but particularly with Jamie Raskin, who is a true American hero. Um, as, uh, as you know, I'm the founder and CEO of Common Sense Media. I'm also a professor at Stanford. And I teach con law, so one of the things that makes Jamie's book so extraordinary is he is also a constitutional law professor, um, and I'm sure we're going to hear about that from him today in the conversation. But just a little background about Jamie, uh, because he's a unique member of Congress. He's had an extraordinary career. He's obviously affected all of our lives in such special ways over the past few years. But when he came into Congress in 2013 as a congressperson from Maryland, he had one of the most unique greatest collection of skills, I think, of any congressperson that we've ever seen, that we've seen in, in, in decades. He's raised in a family in Washington, D.C. and Maryland that cared about and thought deeply about the future direction of our, of our country. As I mentioned to Jamie earlier, his dad, Marcus Raskin, came out and spoke when I was an undergrad at Stanford and was one of the most intelligent, best, biggest thinkers in, in, American, in American social thought for many years. And both of his parents were talented and prolific writers, not of tweets, but of books. And he got a great education, as you'll know, as, from reading his book and hopefully from the conversation today. He served as deputy state attorney general, started a remarkable family, became a law professor, as I said, about the Constitution, became a leader in the Maryland State Senate, and is just one of those people who has served our country in a number of ways for years. More than anything, I think, he would admit that what brought him with him to the extraordinary halls of Congress is sort of a spirit in his step and a big, a great attitude and spirit in life. And I think he took what he learned and what he cares about and who he is and turned that into a bright and shining light for all of us that attracted colleagues on both sides of his aisle. If you ever speak to our congressperson, Nancy Pelosi, um, he, Jamie obviously caught her eye and, and the leadership in Congress um, as both an intellectual and constitutional pillar of the Democrats in, in, in the House. Um, he's here to talk to us today about two experiences in his life that actually nearly extinguished the light that he represents, and I would say nearly, because obviously they have not. And I think that he knows from his personal challenges the extraordinary resilience and grit that makes this country great, but actually made people like Jamie Rask and great leaders for us, and I'm sure we're gonna hear about that today. Um, and I think nobody will, can deny that we've lived through a couple of, or several really long and complicated years in this country. And to have Congressman Jamie Raskin be such a beacon of light and hope during really difficult times, I think sets an example for all of us. And it's what makes me so proud to introduce him today and to welcome him here to the great city of San Francisco. Um, he's going to be interviewed or moderated today by Marisa Lagos, the political correspondent for KQED, who I'm sure many of you hear regularly. So please join me in welcoming Jamie Raskin and Marisa Lagos to the Commonwealth Club. <laughs> Woohoo! Yay! Nice job. Hey everybody, thank you Jim, and he said my name correctly. Good job. Um, as Jim mentioned, I'm Marisa Lagos. I'm correspondent for our politics desk at KQED, and I co-host a weekly show called Political Breakdown that I'm shooting to get the congressman on soon as well. Um, I'm very excited to be moderating this program. We are going to be talking with Congressman Jamie Raskin about his new book, Unthinkable, 
Trauma, Truth, and the Trials of American Democracy. I want to remind everyone, if you're here with us in San Francisco and have a question for the congressman, you can write it on the question cards you have near your seats. And if you're watching online, you can put your questions in the text chat on YouTube. We will be getting to those later in the program, but certainly as things come up um, and you think of it, write them down. Congressman, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me and doing this. And thanks, you all, thanks to everybody here for coming. That's really nice. So. <clears throat> And thank you, Jim Steyer, too, for s pronouncing my name correctly. <laughs> he better, he better. <laughs> so uh, this book is really about sort of twin tragedies, a, a public trauma and, and a more private one um, that occurred with your family, at your son's suicide, just days before the insurrection on the Capitol. Um, and I want to talk about all of that. But as I read it and learned more about you, what, what struck me is like your deep belief in our democracy and our democratic constitutional de democratic system um, and its sort of ability to you know fulfill the promise that our founders made and and your uh, Jim mentioned your dad it seems like some of that probably goes back to your own family story so I thought we might start with him because um, he's got a pretty incredible story that certainly informed you um, he ended up leaving Wisconsin, was it? Or, yes. Yeah. Um, to go to Juilliard uh, and then ended up in the White House. So <laughs> take us through a little bit of that. Like, what, what, how did your dad end up in politics after starting off in music? Yeah, well, my, my dad was a, a pretty wild guy. He, he grew up in a place called Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, although he called it White Folks Bay, and he got out as quickly as he could, uh, <laughs> and he ran away to New York City. He was a... a piano prodigy, and so he went to study music at the, um, the, Br the Bronx School of the Arts and then went to Juilliard. Um, but he then went back to the Midwest to the University of Chicago and um, uh, ended up kind of dividing his career between music and piano and law and political philosophy. And he went to law school with a very specific agenda in mind, which was how to prevent uh, war and genocide. And that was really why he went and what he thought about it. And he ended up working originally on Capitol Hill and then for President Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And um, he... That went uh, kind of sideways. Yeah. The well, Bay of Pigs. His first day of work was the Bay of Pigs. <laughs> uh, and uh, and my, my dad wrote a memo to President Kennedy as a as the, the deputy to McGeorge Bundy, the national security advisor, and he took it upon himself on his first day of work to write a memo saying um, that, that because of the Bay of Pigs, the US should um, build um, a hospital at Guantanamo Bay and give it to the Cuban people as a gift to them. So he, yeah, he didn't last happen. that long on the National Security Council. Uh, <laughs> because of his views but he you know he was there for a few years and he ended up creating a think tank called the institute for policy studies and he he was uh involved in um the the vietnam war uh, peace movement right well let's get to that because you were i think five years old when he and he was, was indicted, indicted with dr spock and william sloan coffin in a, in a case called the boston five mm -hmm. trial uh for conspiracy to aid and abet draft evasion and um, all of them ended up having their convictions reversed and so on, but my dad was the only one acquitted, um, and largely because he kind of put the war on trial and said it was an illegal war, it was an unconstitutional war. They were not civil disobedience, but they were citizens standing up for the Constitution and for the rule of law and for the Geneva Conventions. And his, his lawyer was Telford Taylor. So it, when he was acquitted, the other four defendants were convicted, and th th he was asked by the New York Times, uh, how did he feel on the day that he was acquitted? And he said, I feel like demanding a, real a retrial. Uh, <laughs> because, um, you know, uh, unlike, you know, all the right-wingers today, when they get prosecuted, they go out, they find their own lawyers, they, you know, point fingers at each other, but they were sticking together, and... Um, um, but anyway, that, that made remember, an impression on me. Do you remember that? I mean, you were very young, but 
Did it did it scare you? Was it something that your family talked about? Well, it impressed upon me the the power of government and what government can do to people. Um, And um, I mean, I remember one of my earliest memories was asking whether the government would end up paying for all of the lawyers and everything since the government had lost. And the answer was no. Uh, And um, that made an impression on me. But I I, I think I started taking constitutional law and criminal law very seriously as a as a kid. And it was, you know, something I ended up wanting to study and becoming a professor of constitutional law. I got called on my first week of uh, criminal law by Alan Dershowitz, who was my professor, because he had worked on that case as an, as an intern on, you know, on the side of uh, the defendants. And um, that, that was probably my, my happiest memory involving Alan Dershowitz. And, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it just it went downhill from there, yeah. especially during the impeachment trial where he began to attack me and wrote an article saying that my father would be ashamed of what I was doing in prosecuting yeah. Donald Trump. So. Um, well, I doubt that, knowing what I little I know about <laughs> yeah. your dad. I well, mean, I appreciate that. You, I, write, uh, you write in your book <laughs> that this trial indictment, which really was aimed at not just chilling the speech and activities of these five people, but Ray, it was a, sort of a message that it only really intensified his activism, um, anti-war activism and otherwise. I mean, was that something that... I don't know. Did, did you hold that growing up? Was well, that I mean, I always grew up with the sense that um, the highest office in democracy is that of citizen. And it's a serious office and people have to be serious about it, engaged in it and participate in it. But those of us who aspire and attain to public office are nothing but the servants of the people. And, um, you know, if somebody decides that because they're in public office, they're above the people, they're above the law and they trample the law, then that's the moment to evict, eject, reject, impeach, convict, and start over again, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the real sort of heart center of this book, and to some extent it seems your family, was your son, Tommy. Um, And I mean, he just seems like he was a remarkable person from the get-go. You talk about him as a child, really, almost empath- empathic to a fault. Um, can you tell us maybe one of the stories from his childhood when he was young? It sounds like he started probably because of you and your wife and the work you did. He was very attuned to the world and sort of what was going on from current affairs. And he he became much like your father, it sounds like, anti-war, anti-violence at a young age. He, he, he was that indeed. And he was like a world-class empath. I mean, he he felt the the pain and the suffering of people all over the world. I mean, the civil war in Yemen just wrecked him. You know, he was working very hard against the Saudi intervention um, in in Yemen. Um, he, um, you know, he became a vegan uh, when he was in college and became very serious about talking about animal slaughter and how in the future people would come back and look at it the way that we look at like slavery today or the wars of religion in Europe. It's something that we would get beyond and he felt that way about war too. And that's why, I mean, one of the ways that we've tried to deal with just the catastrophic loss of Tommy Raskin is just to think of him as like, uh, a visitor from 500 years from now, uh, you know. It struck me he was very gentle for this world. Yeah, he, he was remarkable, and he was an incredibly funny young man, too. I mean, he was a, a poet. Uh, you can find his poetry online, and we're in the process of collecting his poetry. He was a playwright. He was like a stand-up comedian. Um, he was a second-year student at Harvard Law School uh, when we lost him. Um, he was a teacher. Uh, and he was teaching classes at Harvard College, um, and um, but and he was he had a very libertarian sensibility. I mean, uh, one of the stories I told in the book was about when he was a kid. Um, I think he was just eight or nine years old at the time. But one of the kids in his class got suspended for I think writing some bad words on the board, and he had to stay home for a week. And I was walking Tommy to school on Monday, and I saw 
that the boy was going back to school. He was walking across the street with his mom. And I said, you know, um, look, there's, there's Philip. He's, they, they let him out of jail. And Tommy said, you mean they let him back into jail? <laughs> so, uh, um, he always had kind of an anarchist kind of sensibility <laughs> about, about institutions, you know? So. I also found it really interesting that he was so put off by the separation within his schools. He was on a pretty academic track. We used to call it magnet. Yes. Um, but that he felt very much like it was unfair, sort of, that people were segregated by that kind of academic difference. Yeah, he was very troubled by got that. Got in trouble once for making friends with a, an immigrant child who... Yes. They assumed was part of a gang because he was from El Salvador. Like, why would Tommy be hanging around with the kids from, you know, the other side of the tracks when yeah. he's in the magnet program and he was hanging out with these other kids at lunch? And yeah, we got a, a call from the school, from the disciplinarian who said, you know, your son was hanging around with a boy whose cousin is a known drug dealer kind of thing. And Tommy was just so upset about that. But when he was in high school, um, you know, we, we, we have a wonderful public high school where, where Tommy went, and um, uh, he was in a, a magnet program, and, but he was very upset about, you know, the, the differences. And, you know, I mean, high schools are naturally cliquish kinds of things, but he just hated the idea that there was this divide. And what he did was, he, he also said he hated cheating, and there was like rampant cheating going on in the school. And he, he took the position, at all the schools, you know? And he said, there's just so much cheating going on, and everybody knows that there's cheating, and we're cheating ourselves. We should just forget about the grades and the tests and just teach people, and then we're not gonna have this big cheating problem. And so when he'd be in a class of people were cheating, he would stand up and he'd say, I'm not participating in this test anymore because people are cheating, and you guys are pretending to teach us, and we're pretending to learn, and everybody's pretending to be obeying the rules, and it's stupid, you know? <laughs> but uh, he created a, a tutoring program, which still exists, at Blair High School um, called Bliss, and he got it off the ground, and the idea was basically to take, you know, to take the kids who had, like, surplus understanding and had been doing well and use them to tutor the kids who were having problems or who were just learning English or yeah. whatever it was. And it was a, a pretty, pretty cool project. So Tommy was ahead of his days. Well, it seems like he and your whole family are really a big part of why you originally decided to run um, for the state legislature in Maryland. Um, you had been a professional, a professor of constitutional law for what, 25 years. Yes. Um, and another Tommy story, you talk about being at a kickoff event and getting up and kind of giving what, the beginning of a stump speech and being told by somebody that you should really drop the marriage equality part. Um, and Tommy was sort of watching this exchange. Will you relay that story? and Because yeah, well, it seems like <laughs> yeah. it was pretty remarkable. This, he was like 11 at the time, how involved he was in kind of shaping yeah. your campaign. Well, Tommy was just like, a, a, a political natural. I mean, he just understood politics in a profound way. Um, but I ran, when I first ran in that race, I ran against a 32 year incumbent um, who had uh, been supporting uh, the death penalty, had uh, been blocking marriage equality, um, had introduced a pro Iraq war resolution. So I was running as the progressive reformer against a 32 year incumbent. But, but, a lot of people were saying, well, are, are you running against uh, the incumbent um, because she's getting old? And Tommy said, tell them you're not running against the incumbent because she's getting old. You're running against the incumbent because you're getting old, <laughs> because I'm getting old. You know? <laughs> and so uh, I thought that was a great line you know, for an 11-year-old kid. But, but, but when I made that speech, I sort of laid out everything that I wanted to do in office. We wanted to abolish the death penalty after four centuries in Maryland, and we ended up doing that. And we wanted to pass marriage equality and to become the first state south of the Mason-Dixon line to do that. We ended up doing that. We wanted to decriminalize marijuana. We wanted the toughest gun safety law in America. It went through the whole thing, but this woman came up and she said, you know, great speech, loved your speech, but take out all that stuff you got in there about gay marriage, because it's not gonna happen. This is in 2006. Uh, it's never gonna happen. Even the gay candidates don't talk about it. And it makes you sound like you're really extreme, like you're not in the political center. And uh, Tommy was watching me real carefully to see how was I gonna respond to this because it was like 
10 degrees outside and I didn't have that many uh, attendees with me that day at the, you know, at the kickoff. But I said, thank you for telling me what you said because it's given me an epiphany and it, it makes me realize that it's not my ambition to be in the political center, which blows around with the wind. It's my ambition to be in the moral center, to try to find what's right the best that we can and bring the political center to us. And uh, so, yeah, um, uh, you know, I think Tommy liked that answer. And so I liked the fact that he liked it. And that has basically been, you know, the anchor of my political career ever since. And that first campaign, when I first announced, the Washington Post had this article about it, quoting a pundit who said, Raskin's chances of victory are considered impossible. And then nine months later, we got 67% of the vote. And they, there was an article quoting a another pundit who said Raskin's victory was inevitable. So we went from impossible to inevitable in nine months because the pundits are never wrong. Uh, but the, and that basically became like the motto of our democracy summer project, you know, with the young people. Yeah, I mean, so, talk about that, because to me, that seems like such an interesting model and one that let allowed you to get your kids and their cousins and your family involved, but really seems to have some legs and still exist. Yeah, well, and uh, I mean, it certainly allowed me to satisfy my longing to still be teaching and to be with young people. Um, but yeah, basically, I mean, I'm from a pretty blue district, uh, somewhat less blue after the redistricting, but um, I'm in a blue district. And so I'd, I spend no money on pollsters, TV, radio, consultants, all that stuff. Um, uh, we spend our money locally on a school that it's called Democracy Summer, and we bring in high school and college kids. We train them on the history of uh, social change in America. Uh, the last several years, um, the great Bob Moses kicked us off and talked about Freedom Summer in Mississippi. Of course, we lost Bob um, at the end of last year. Um, but it's very much inspired by the Freedom Summer model of young people can be the ones who can change the world. And so we train them to register voters, educate voters, mobilize people, um, but to take a, like a comprehensive and soulful approach to politics. And, um, you know, and that was something that I did with Tommy and Hannah and Tabitha, our kids and a bunch of my nieces and nephews when we started. And now the, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee has adopted Democracy Summer. So we're going to be in 60 or 65 congressional districts across the country uh, this summer. Yeah. And, um, and there are a bunch of the Californians, including Jared Huffman, who I know is around here. And of course, Speaker Pelosi has been a big supporter of it. Katie Porter, a bunch of the Californians. Yeah. What I mean, I want to move into more current politics, and I'm curious, like, that first answer you gave about wanting to be the moral center, what lessons do you think that holds right now for Democrats? Because I think there's a lot of hand-wringing about, you know, questions over how to talk about crime and policing, how to frame the war in Ukraine. Um, there's all the critical race theory stuff happening, you know, the anti-trans bill. Like, and I think there's a sense among some more moderates in the Democratic Party that... Democrats went too far on some of these issues, that they're out ahead of maybe the electorate. Are you, do you still feel that it's important to kind of, um, you know, lead on some of those issues? Well, I think we totally have to lead on those issues. We are the party of democracy. We're the party of the vast majority of the people. And right now, at this point, I say this with no glee, but we are the only pro-democracy party, major party in America. Um, and... Um, you know, I, I give a little lecture usually at the beginning of Democracy Summer when I say, let's replace PC political correctness with PC political courage, uh, not proving uh, the moral superiority of our position to everybody else, but rather going out and connecting with people you wouldn't otherwise talk with and learn from them and organize them. Um, in the spirit of Bob Moses, which was all, it was all about listening, that the heart of organizing is listening to people and to l listen to where they're coming from. So, I mean, th on the police question, I, personally, I've never had a problem with that. And certainly after January 6th, I 
am very clear about that. Those police officers saved our lives against a real live fascist white nationalist movement on January 6th. So we need the police. And I, I defend those working class cops who saved our lives like Officer Dunn and Officer Fanon and Officer Hodges who got stuck in the doorway. Uh, those cops saved our lives and saved the, demo saved the democracy and they saved the lives of a lot of politicians who don't even have the courage to vote for an investigation of what happened on January 6th. So uh, we need the cops and we d defend those working class public servants just like teachers, just like firefighters, just like first responders. Yeah. Well, let's talk about January 6th. Um, you know, you were obviously there and ended up uh, leading the impeachment afterward, uh, the second impeachment of President Trump. Um, I wonder if you could just start by telling us a little bit about that day for you. You were still in, well, not that you're ever out of the throes of grief when you lose a child, but it was so close to uh, Tommy's death. You had just, I think, laid him to rest the day before. Um, and your daughter and son-in-law, but not her husband, important to know, right? <laughs> your other daughters, oh, right. they, they came to the Capitol that day to support you. So can you talk a little bit about like what you were expecting that day to be like and why you invited them? Or, or Well, what we wanted? had been getting ready for January 6th for several months because we had anticipated um, this attempt to object to electoral college votes. And we um, predicted a whole bunch of parliamentary attacks on the counting of electoral college votes, which of course is a constitutional assignment built into the 12th Amendment. It says that on the first Wednesday of the first week of January following the presidential election, the House and the Senate shall meet in joint session in order to receive and to count the electoral college vote. So we had anticipated pretty much everything that they were going to do, including trying to get Vice President Mike Pence to step outside of his constitutional role to usurp the role of Congress Congress and to declare heretofore unknown extra constitutional powers to reject electoral college votes coming in specifically from Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, um, as well as specific objections to particular states. Now, fortunately, those objections were not only ludicrous, but they were known to be ludicrous because more than 60 different federal and state courts had rejected every allegation of electoral fraud and corruption, including eight judges who Donald Trump had himself nominated to the federal bench. So we were ready to refute everything. Um, it would have been more complicated had Mike Pence come in um, proclaiming these these unconstitutional powers, which Trump was trying to get him uh, to announce, but he didn't do that. When we got there at one o'clock, we got a memo from Vice President Pence given to both sides of the aisle, explaining why he didn't have the power to do what Trump wanted him to do. Now, we had also been anticipating violence, but we didn't think, none of us anticipated the violence coming inside and laying siege to the Capitol. And that's why I say in the book that we anticipated every possibility except for what actually happened, uh, which was the convergence of an inside political coup with a violent right-wing street insurrection against the police and against the vice president and the Congress. Let's unpack that, because I think the how you frame it is really important, the a coup versus an insurrection. And you really lay out how that attempt is, I think, closer than a lot of people realize here. I think there's a sense from a lot of people that, you know, the what happened that day, you know, we all focus on the violence for understandable reasons, but there was sort of just like very procedural mechanisms, like calling a contingent election that you believe your colleagues were prepared to do. That's the heart of it. Yeah. So yeah, let, let me, yeah, let me unpack that. So the, there were, th I think, three rings of sedition you have to understand. There was a mass wild protest called for by the president that became a mob riot, which injured 150 cops with broken jaws, broken necks, broken vertebrae, lost fingers, traumatic brain injuries, post-traumatic stress syndrome. It was the worst mob riot in the history of Washington, D.C. that took place at the Capitol. Okay, there was a middle ring of a violent insurrection 
uh, that was made up of domestic violent extremist groups, racist and white nationalist groups, some political and religious authoritarian cults that were in there, the Proud Boys who Donald Trump had told to stand back and stand by at the first presidential uh, debate, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters who've been charged with seditious conspiracy, which means conspiracy to overthrow the government, the QAnon networks, the militia groups, the Unification Church, which I didn't even know still existed, uh, but it, it does, and they were there, and uh, Christian white nationalist groups. Okay, these people came having engaged in paramilitary training, prepared to begin the assault on our officers, to sort of to teach the crowd to become a mob, um, and then to smash out our windows, knock down our doors, and lay siege to the Capitol, interrupting the counting of electoral college votes for the first time in American history. That was not the scariest ring, okay? Do, the scariest was the coup. On, what, before you yeah. move on to that, though, I mean, do you think, from what you, you know, the work you've done since then, that that, that they accomplished their goal, or would they have gone further? Well, if you read the ultra-right wing websites, um, they certainly celebrate and commemorate January 6th the way that Donald Trump told them to, never forget this day, this is a day of celebration, all of that stuff. Uh, they, they do commemorate, they celebrate it. They, they had come a long way from uh, August of 2017 when they gathered in Charlottesville to unite the right and they were only 500. Now they were several thousand stormtroopers acting as a vanguard of a march of 40 or 50,000 people that almost overthrew the, overthrew the whole US government, you know? So they considered it a day of victory, except they fought themselves for one thing, which was leaving their weapons back in the trunks of the cars and in the hotels and motels. And the reason they did that, by the way, was because the Secret Service was checking weapons down at the White House where the rally was taking place. And so, Thank God they all decided to go there and they were told leave their guns behind. So that's why they ended up using baseball bats and steel pipes and Confederate battle flags to assault our officers rather than um, I mean, what the do you guns think the and the knives. What game would have been? Would it to hold the Capitol? To just keep him in power? Well, if you read their websites, a lot of them were talking about killing all the members of Congress, saying this was a unique moment get them all down to the basement, gas them, or at least kill enough Democrats that we would lose in the votes uh, f with respect to objections of particular states. That Which goes gets to the us coup. Back to, yeah. It gets to the coup. So what was the real strategy here? And I don't have time to get into everything Trump had been doing um, up until then. You recall he tried to get state legislatures to nullify the popular vote and just in state Trump Electoral College slates, they, they approached 30 different election officials to try to get them to uh, concoct Trump victories. It's like Trump calling Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, just find me 11,781 votes. That's not Trump trying to stop election fraud, that's Trump trying to create election fraud. That, that was an attempt to commit it, right? Um, but again, miraculously, all of these people said no to him, which is why they're paying now. They've put one of my colleagues, Jody Heiss, up against Brad Raffensperger. They're running somebody against him. Anybody who didn't follow Trump's will, they're getting rid of now. But it all came down to January 6th. And the whole idea was get Pence just to return electoral college votes to these state legislatures, which sounds, I don't know if it sounds reasonable, but it sounds at least lawful, but it's not. There's nothing in the Electoral Count Act of 1887. There's nothing in the 12th Amendment about returning electoral college votes to the states, much less through some kind of unilateral decision of the vice president, right? Why did they want to do that? Well, they were going to lower Joe Biden's majority in the Electoral College from 306 to below 270. It so happened that Biden had the exact same margin over Trump that Trump had over Hillary, 306 to 232, uh, a margin that Trump had declared a landslide in 2016. Okay, but just get it below 270, and then what happens? Well, under the 12th Amendment, as you say, Marisa, the provisions are very clear. If nobody has a majority when Congress receives and counts those electors, the contest shifts immediately into the House of Representatives for a so-called contingent election. Now, why would Trump want Speaker Pelosi and the Democrats to be deciding, well, they know that under the 12th Amendment, we're not voting one member, one vote the way we usually vote. 
were voting one state, one vote. And after the 2020 elections, the GOP controlled 27 state delegations. We have 22 state delegations. Pennsylvania is split nine to nine, so they're off the field. It's 27 to 22. So even had they suffered the defection of my new best friend, the at-large representative from Wyoming, Liz Cheney, they still would have had 26 votes in the bag. So they, it would have been like 26 to 22 or 26 to 23. Three, they would have run it like the Republican convention. They would have said, Donald Trump is president. And at that point, he was prepared to follow the advice of his disgraced former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, who was telling him, invoke the Insurrection Act, declare martial law, call out the National Guard at that point to put down all the insurrectionary chaos that he had unleashed against us. And that's how close we came to having a coup in America. It was only because Vice, Vice President Pence refused to go along with this. And I'm talking about a guy who engaged in four years of completely invertebrate sycophancy and obsequious <laughs> towards Donald Trump. On that day, he did his job and he was a constitutional patriot. And speaking of Flynn, we've also learned through some excellent reporting since then that Trump was approaching Department of Justice to do some of these things, yes. right? I, I, well, that was a maneuver right before they got to January 6th, which is let's seize the election machinery right. in the swing states uh, and get the military to rerun the election. DHS, and yeah. They Jim, were you, you know about that provision in the Constitution that allows the military to rerun the election, right? <laughs> you, you know about that. That's happened a lot in our history, you know? So, um, um, mm -hmm. I don't know how to say this politely, but what you've laid out is a pretty, like, deep constitutional, I, I think you would call it a conspiracy. They might call it an argument for a way to, to proceed. I, I don't yeah. know that watching Giuliani over the last few years that I believe he could come up with. That. Do you do you have any sense like did your colleagues across the aisle help come up with this idea? Like do, have you guys I, and I know there's obviously going to be stuff you can't talk about that you, you've been investigating. But well, I saw one of my colleagues when we when we were evacuated from the house and remember somebody got up and said, put on your gas masks. We didn't even know we had gas masks. Um, and- um, Your Democrat, I, I read, you said your Democratic colleagues went out on the Republican side thinking they might be safer there. Because, a lot of Democrats yeah. up in the gallery shifted over to the Republican side because they thought, see, what everybody thought of course is that somebody with more than 900 people having entered the building without going through security, everybody's first thought was, somebody's going to have an AR-15 yeah. because that's, right, that's America. the society we live in, right? Somebody shows up with an AR-15. But um, Sorry, you're going to tell the story. You, you overheard one of your colleagues on the phone. One of, one of my colleagues over the phone, I just heard him saying, y'all screwed it up. Y'all screwed it up good. And basically what he was saying, I understood him to be saying, was that the violent insurrection part went too far. It went beyond postponing the proceedings and putting the pressure on Pence to overtaking the whole thing so that the coup part of it was brought to life and we had a chance to mobilize against everything that had happened. Um, you know, Donald Trump, uh, I mean, he's a, a clever guy in his way, he creates little franchises. It wasn't like it was one mass conspiracy. There were multiple conspiracies related to the white nationalist domestic violent extremist groups. There was a political coup part of it. There were certainly members of Congress who were very well aware and involved in this plan to try to reject electors, return the electoral college vote, and then run very quickly the 12th Amendment contingent election. All of these different things were going on. There were a handful of people who were probably aware of all of it. It's, you know, we've gotten overwhelming participation in the January 6th Select Committee, except the immediate entourage right around Trump, Trump, Meadows, um, Steve Bannon, uh, you know, that inner group. So, but the closer you get, the more people knew everything, but there were people who just knew their little piece of the puzzle. And that's like what the Proud Boys were doing and the Oath Keepers and the Concerned Women for America First and all that. What is it like continuing to serve alongside people that you believe were part of this conspiracy that, you know, either participated in or at least didn't denounce violence. I, I just, 
I mean, it's like just being an American today. What's it like for any of us to be in a situation where this thing is not remotely over and Donald Trump is still at large? Do you have um, Republicans that you still consider friends that you can? Well, some of them are my best Liz friends. Cheney. <laughs> okay, well, so yeah, there's Liz Cheney, there's Adam Kinzinger. I mean, we did get 10 Republicans who voted to impeach. Right. We had seven in the Senate creating the, uh, the most robust bipartisan majority to vote to convict a president in American history. I mean, we didn't hit 67, so he beat the constitutional spread, but we've only had four presidential impeachments reach the Senate in American history. There's Andrew Johnson, there's Bill Clinton, for you know what, Donald Trump won, Donald Trump two, and ours came the very closest and did end up with a resounding bipartisan and bicameral uh, majority declaring as a legislative fact that Donald Trump incited a violent insurrection against the union. So arguably, right now, if you take Section 3 of the 14th Amendment seriously, uh, Donald Trump can't serve in office again because it says if you've sworn an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution and you've engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the union, you may not serve in federal or state office again. So uh, I'm hoping that won't be the last you hear about Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. You write in here kind of on the same idea that Jim Jordan uh, sees you as enemies. Um, and I just wonder, like, is there... When you, I mean, looking forward to to the possibility that Democrats could lose the House, I mean, what do you think it would look like having him chairing as a judiciary that he's been promised? Like, like how, like when you see a colleague like that in the rhetoric, I don't know. Like, how do you think about that? Well, the, the reason it's so troubling is, look, I mean, I I was a state senator for ten years, and I had a lot of Republican friends. I never once thought of any of the Republicans as my enemy. I really didn't think of them that way. I mean, I'm a middle child. I like bringing people together and, you know, hanging out with the Republicans. And, you know, we had Republicans on my side for a whole bunch of things, including abolishing the death penalty, marriage equality, you know. Um, and that, that just comes a lot more naturally to me. I mean, I'm not the most partisan person in the world. But um, I, the reason I say we've got one democracy party left is because I think that Lincoln's party, and I'm somebody who loves Abraham Lincoln, I've got a bust of him on my desk that I inherited from my grandfather. Um, Lincoln's party is no more. It's Trump's party now. And it is much more an authoritarian cult of personality than it is a political party. I mean, 2020 was a remarkable year for a lot of reasons. One of them was it was the first time in modern political history where one of the parties did not adopt a platform at its convention. So they came back from their convention and they said they just didn't come up with a platform. Well, what does that tell you? What's their platform? Whatever Donald Trump says it is, is their platform and they all accept it. And their real agenda is just voter suppression. It is the denial of democracy. They're a rule or ruin party. Either they're gonna rule and control everything or they're gonna ruin our ability to get anything done. Um, it was like pulling teeth to get a bipartisan infrastructure plan through. $1.9 trillion investment in our roads and our highways and our bridges and ports and airports and universal broadband. And I mean, we had Republican sponsors of the bill who they were trying to pull off of the bill and to get to vote against it because they can't accept the idea that we would be able to get anything done. I mean, the whole thing is they want to be able to say, um, you know, the, the failed policies of Joe Biden, who I think is doing a great job. It's not failed policies, it's blocked policies. They're doing whatever they can to prevent us from making progress, which strikes me as a profoundly unpatriotic way of thinking about government. I mean, there are things that we can disagree on and there are things we can agree on, but they suddenly say, no, there's nothing we can agree on. Our only objective is to prevent you from getting anything done. Yeah. Do you think Democrats should have seen this coming? You, you write at one point that we Democrats are in love with the rule of law and that perhaps it made liberals more blind. I mean, in high, I mean hindsight's 2020, but what do you think what well, it's like that sign? thing about enemies. I mean, it's a different way of thinking about politics, you know, mm -hmm. that you're actually out to destroy the other side. And I don't think that comes naturally to a lot of Democrats. Um, 
I mean, you know, we felt cheated in some ways by the presidential election of 2016 because of Vladimir Putin's constant interference and cyber sabotage and surveillance and so on. But what do we do? We gather several million strong, put on pink hats and join Indivisible. We don't go beat up a bunch of police officers and try to overthrow the election, right? So there is a there's a difference, you know, I think in philosophy there. There are people on that side now who do not respect the constitutional order. They don't respect the outcome of our elections and they don't, they won't take no for an answer. It's like Donald Trump, he refuses to concede defeat when he clearly lost the election. There is simply no, no factual dispute about it. He lost the election and yet he's convinced tens of millions of people that he won the election. I mean, that's just absolute derangement. Um, and it, it's a betrayal of what you could view as the basic responsibility of a political party in a democracy, right? I mean, we just lost an election in Virginia for governor. We weren't happy about that, but we didn't storm the state capitol and go and try to injure hundreds of uh, officers and call it a lie. We said, okay, we, we messed up. We allowed them to lie about critical race theory and everything. Let's figure out how to deal with that next time. The good news is that we are the vast majority of the country. I mean, Hillary beat him by three million votes. Joe Biden beat him by seven and a half million votes. The young people are coming our way. The new Americans are coming our way. They are a minority party, a shrinking minority party. And what they've got is a bag of tricks. And they're all anti-democracy tricks. The filibuster, the gerrymandering of our elections, the voter suppression, tactics, the packing of the courts and the right wing judicial activism, all of it. So I, I'm with the Democratic philosophers like John Dewey, who said that the only solution to the ills of democracy is more democracy. You got to get rid of the tricks. You got to get rid of all of these mechanisms that prevent the majority from ruling. And yet, <laughs> let's be happy for a minute. <laughs> And yet, I mean, Biden's agenda has stalled in some ways. We haven't seen voting, you know, national voting um, rights pass. The Supreme, filibuster. The, the filibuster, the Supreme Court is poised to do a lot this year, including potentially overturn Roe v. Wade. I mean, just like they Demo cut the heart out of the Voting Rights Act. Right. But are Democrats like playing at a different game at this point? I mean, how do you, you know, sort of win this battle if if the other side is not playing by the same rules? Yeah. Well, the, a lot of the mechanisms they're using against us are not of a constitutional dimension. The gerrymandering of our districts is not something that's built into the Constitution. We can get rid of that, you know, but, and we tried to get rid of it in the For the People Act and, um, you know, in the Freedom to Vote Act. And the, I mean, GOP now stands for the gerrymander only party, and they will do anything to defend gerrymandering uh, because they keep perpetuating their own reign. So we, we do have to deal with that. But in the meantime, they're drawing much more, many more of the districts than we are, more than double of the districts they're drawing against us. So then we say, all right, we'll, we'll try to deal with that by passing the For the People Act. And we pass it in the House, but it gets to the Senate and they block it with another anti-democratic instrument, the filibuster. That's not in the Constitution. That's not in federal law. That's a rule of the Senate. It's a rule that's already got more than 100 exceptions where the filibuster doesn't operate with respect to the Budget Reconciliation Act, the Trade Adjustment Authority, dozens and dozens of purposes. You would think we could cut out an exception to the filibuster for voting rights, which is the heart of democracy, right? But they won't do it, and so the disease kills the cure. They're able to use the filibuster to block our attempts to reform the filibuster uh, and to vindicate voting rights. So then they use all of that power illegitimately um, one, two, uh, pass voter suppression statutes in the states to roll back weekend voting, roll back early voting, to make it more difficult to engage in mail-in balloting. So w what is the solution? Well, first of all, let's stop blaming ourselves for what they're doing, okay? Number two, um, let's organize our people the vast majority that's out there to do whatever we can at the state level, in every state, and the county level, and the local level, to protect people's voting rights and get the lawyers in and let's do it. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it's going to it's going to be a struggle. But there's no time here for despondency and 
disenchantment and understand that's a strategy that comes right from the top, from Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump. Let's bum everybody out. Let's demoralize the Democrats so they just say there's nothing that can be done. And it's not true. So we can swamp them just by organizing effectively the mass majorities that are out there on the side of democracy. I think there's going to be a, a lot at play in these midterms. Obviously, the situation in Ukraine, um, <laughs> inflation, gas prices, all the things we talked about. But this January 6th commission um, could be making news over the coming months as well. And I, and I wonder what you would view as success out of that inquiry. What does it look like? What is the hope? Well, <clears throat> we have to um, recover the idea of truth in American politics. I mean, my dad used to say that uh, democracy needs a ground to stand on, and that ground is the truth. Um, you know, we're not unified in America by virtue of being one race or one ethnicity or one ideology or one party, but we have one constitution and one rule of law, and the truth is the basis of it, but we've got, um, you know, people who are out there just spreading lies on a daily basis, conspiracy theory, and you know, quack medical cures and just nonsense. But again, I come back to, uh, you, you gotta go with Tom Paine and Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony, like the radical Democrats of our history who believed in the wisdom of crowds. And we're seeing it today in the massive rejection of Putin and Trump in their violent assault uh, on the democratic sovereignty of the people of Ukraine. And we're seeing the democracies all over the world, the democratic peoples and movements and governments standing up against that war crime and that war of aggression taking place in Ukraine. And uh, understand exactly where Donald Trump and the right wing is. They're on the side of that. Those are the same people. Right? It's Putin in Russia, it's Trump in America, it's Orban in Hungary, Duterte in the Philippines, El Sisi in Egypt, Bolsonaro in Brazil, the homicidal crown prince of Saudi Arabia. All of the dictators, the autocrats, the kleptocrats and bullies have found each other. So this is our moment. It's the Democrats versus the autocrats and everybody's gotta choose which side they're on. Yeah. I want to get to a couple of questions from our audience. Um, one person asks if you have any insights into what Merrick Garland is doing regarding the January 6th insurrection and Donald Trump. Well, yeah, I mean, Merrick Garland, um, who, uh, who's my constituent and uh, <laughs> who should be on the Supreme Court right now, um, uh, I, I believe, and I don't know this, and we obviously don't coordinate with the Department of Justice in any way. One of the traditions that was obviously demolished by Donald Trump, which we're trying to rebuild, is respect for the independence of the law enforcement function. So remember, Donald Trump used to try to dictate who are you going to investigate, who are you going to prosecute, you know, don't, don't touch my friends, go after this person. I mean, can we just clap for Joe Biden, at least in respecting the independence of law enforcement. I mean, so, uh, but, but what, I'm, what I'm observing, what I perceive is they're running it like a mob prosecution where you work from the bottom up. So let's start with assault on the officers and um, trespass into the building, refusal to leave, interference with a federal proceeding. Now we're starting to hear uh, charges for seditious conspiracy, conspiracy to overthrow the government. And I believe that they are gonna work all the way up to the kinds of offenses which our committee, the, the January 6th Select Committee, outlined in, uh, in civil court in answer to John Eastman because we tried to subpoena his stuff and he said he had an attorney-client privilege with Donald Trump to which we said, number one, you didn't have an attorney-client privilege because you didn't have an attorney-client relationship. Two, if it existed, it was waived. And three, if it existed and it wasn't waived, then it, you are denied access to it because of the crime fraud exception, which says that you don't have the benefit of the attorney-client privilege if you're using your lawyer to engage in criminal fraud, and this was an attempt to defraud the American people of our right to an honest election 
in 2020. How central do you think Eastman was to this? His familiar face ran for attorney general here. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to work all that out. But the way I'm starting to intuit about Donald Trump is he works in these franchises where he says, well, let's try this with these people and that with those people and so on. But I think that the, the attempt to camouflage mm. this assault on the 2020 election in legal clothing um, was made possible by John Eastman. And I mean, the, the memos he wrote were just pathetic. I mean, I'd give them a D minus for a first year law student. I mean, they were just a joke, but he, they, they are what they are. And these were the memos that they were proceeding on. All right, this is a little f different from what we've been talking about, but one audience member wonders if you would like to comment on the developments today regarding your wife's nomination to the Federal Reserve. So, um, I, I will just say, uh, my wife, Sarah Bloom Raskin, who I met in constitutional law uh, in 1986. Careful uh, out there, law students. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so we, I always tell my students, there's two things to watch out for in law school. One is the Socratic method, and the other is the platonic relationship. And so you've you, you got to make sure you keep your love life alive. But, um, you know, um, I mean, Sarah's had a, a remarkable career. She's been twice confirmed by the U.S. Senate, once unanimously, and once I think it was 93 to 5. Um, and so I, I can guarantee you she hasn't gotten less qualified over the course of her career. But what she did do was to engage in a series of writings and a series of speeches about climate change and how they are a threat to our financial system. And for that, um, the GOP has apparently decided on a unanimous basis in the Senate that she's unfit to be the vice chair of the Fed for uh, regulatory supervision. And I couldn't be prouder of Sarah Bloom Raskin and what her career has been like and her commitment to confront climate change, because obviously um, the whole point of saving our democracy at this moment in our history is let's save the democracy so we can go on to save the species mm -hmm. and deal with climate change. You know. On that, mm -hmm. um, it seems like some of, I don't know if we're supposed to say build back better anymore, but yeah. it, Seems pretty dead, but then it seems like there might be some pieces revived. And I have a question here about just broadly how we can decrease gas, greenhouse gas emissions and create renewable jobs. Do you think that pieces of that, uh, you know, the Biden agenda will get picked up this year? Um, or are we sort of already approaching the crunch time of no, the terms? I, I certainly hope so, because we need it. I mean, one of the things we're fighting for is universal pre-K for the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds because we're obviously way behind the rest of the democratic world in terms of making that investment in that critical moment in cognitive and neurological development. Um, I'm sure Jim Steyer can tell you a lot more about it than me, but we need to do that. We need to uh, give the government the power to uh, negotiate with Big Pharma for lower prescription drug prices. Um, a power that we've got in the Medicaid program and we got in the VA program, we don't have it in the Medicare program. Why not? Because Billy Towson slipped in a rider into the legislation and it costs Americans like 35 to $40 billion a year as we're paying four or five times as much as everybody wasn't else. Wasn't that one of the sticking points with your Democratic colleagues in the Senate? Well, two of them, one of them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I guess my point is, is there pieces of that agenda that could get through this divided Senate and maybe you know. Yeah, I don't I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm not in the prognostication business. I'm in the mobilization <laughs> business, you know? So I, I want us to get back into organized for each piece yeah. of it because it and the climate change piece of it is absolutely essential. Um uh, you know, generations to come will regard with astonishment that at a moment when the whole world should be working together to uh, promote renewable energy and to respond to the climate emergency, we're relitigating fights from the last century about racism and fascism and anti Semitism. Th these people have dragged us back into all of the demons and ghosts of the 20th century. All right, we just have a few more minutes left. Um, I have, you know, we started off talking about Tommy, and um, I have a really poignant question for somebody from somebody who. Right, is there. 
Do you have any clue about something or anything I can say to my beautiful, smart, sensitive stepdaughter who is depressed and intent on taking her life? She has two beautiful sons, and she's now in a psych hospital after, thankfully, an unsuccessful drug overdose. Well, I mean, we're, we're in a plague right now. I mean, everywhere I go. Um, I, before I came here, I, some people took me out on a, a boat on the San Francisco Bay, and I was with a woman who lost her 16-year-old son just several weeks ago. Um, you know, we're, we're in a, a nation that has been traumatized by um, COVID-19, which was a profoundly isolating, demoralizing experience for millions and millions of people, and people who are already struggling with mental and emotional health issues found it, in, in many cases, like Tommy, just too much, you know? Uh, but we've lost comparable numbers in the opioid crisis. You know, we've lost people to gun violence and the usual causes. I mean, it's, it's a, we are in an age of trauma right now. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things I say in the book, I, I called a friend of mine who's a professor of classics and I asked him, you know, do we have a, is there a Greek god of trauma? And he said, there's not a Greek god of trauma. So we tried to imagine a Greek god of trauma um, as one kind of like Janus, you know, who looked to the past and the future at the same time. And the Greek god of trauma on the one hand is like a thief who can steal from you everything that's most precious and beloved in your life and just deprive you of all joy and happiness. But on the other side, if you stick with it, the God of trauma will connect you to people in a far deeper way than you ever imagined. You might be connected to them and you would come to understand other people's pain and sorrow. Um, and um, of course, it's not a fair deal. And you say to the God of trauma, I don't quite think that's a fair trade-off. And that's the catch. It's not, it's not a choice. You just, you just have to accept it. I mean, it's, it's in, it's in the nature of that experience. So um, I guess I would say, you know, I'm wishing you all the best, uh, you know, with your daughter and her kids. Um, and um, everybody is both on a, an individual odyssey to deal with their mental and emotional and spiritual health. Um, but all of our odysseys are connected to each other. Um, and that's why, you know, I'm proud of our Democracy Summer Project because we're saying this summer, we're hoping to more than a thousand young people come and join us and be part of a project where we're gonna uplift everybody together and you're gonna find other young people who are struggling with a lot of the same fears you are about climate change, about fascism in Europe, about drugs and alcohol, whatever it might be. And you can talk about it together because uh, the great movements of our history have understood that there's a collective dimension to everybody's happiness. Um, the pursuit of happiness that Jefferson talked about is not just an individual thing, it's something that we do together in public. Mm. I know that following Tommy's death, um, you found some purpose in heading the impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Um, and you do end your book on a note of hope, and we actually have a question from an audience member who asks, where is the hope? So um, I would love just in the last few minutes we have left for you to talk about, you know, what keeps you going and what gives you hope? Well, um, yeah, let me first say a, a word about Nancy Pelosi because I think we're in Nancy's district, aren't we? We are. So, uh, <laughs> this is Nancy town. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Thank you for sending us Speaker Pelosi. Thank you for sending America Speaker Pelosi. Um, and I record in the book how when she asked me to, to be the lead impeachment manager, I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping, I was a wreck. And the truth was I wasn't sure I would ever really be able to do anything again of substance or meaning in my career. Um, and so I say that uh, Nancy in her wisdom and her compassion and her, you know, freakish political clairvoyance, <laughs> uh, she threw me a lifeline, you know, and, um, and she really did throw me a lifeline because she was saying, we need you and we need you to rally and we need you to come back. And, uh, so for that, I will be forever grateful to her. Um, you know, my, my dad used to say, when everything looks hopeless, you're the hope. 
Uh, and um, so it's a responsibility each of us have to provide hope to the other people around us. I think the country does look to California a lot for the hope because we look to California for the future often. And, um, you know, the, the young people, I feel, are providing us a lot of hope. They're beyond racism. They're beyond anti-Semitism. They're beyond misogyny. They're beyond the immigrant bashing. They're also, unfortunately, a little bit beyond grammar, but that's a different <laughs> problem. But the, in general, they're a remarkable d generation. And, uh, and I derive a lot of hope from prior generations of democracy patriots who have just stood up. I mean, I, you know, I, I love reading about Frederick Douglass and what he did in the Reconstruction. I love reading about Lincoln and the vision he had to keep the Union strong, Union and liberty together. And of course, I, um, I spend as much time as I can with my beloved Tom Paine, you know, who, who came over here uh, just two years before the revolution in 1774. Um, and he saw America as the hope for the future, you know, and he looked at it and, and he, he said that this country, uh, if it can uh, live up to the ideals that he saw everywhere, he said if it can live up to its ideals, it would become an asylum to humanity. Not an insane asylum, mind you, okay? <laughs> but, but an asylum, a place of refuge for people fleeing from political and religious and economic oppression from all over the world. Um, and you know, he, then he wrote Common Sense, and, which was so much more radical than anything anybody was thinking. Even the most radical people like Ben Franklin were still talking about, we want the rights of Englishmen. You know, we want to have the rights under the Magna Carta. And Tom Paine said, no, we want independence and we want the ability to start the world anew, to begin the world over again. So I don't know, I, I'll quote for you a passage that always gives me a lot of hope. And um, Speaker Pelosi has made me update the language so it doesn't offend modern sensibilities in California. Uh, but, and she said that, that he wouldn't mind because he was an, an early feminist, which he was, but he said, in the crisis, which he wrote at a really dark time when people didn't know which way things were going. It's like today, like on our side, everybody's saying, what's the message? And we don't know how to message and all of that. And so he wrote this pamphlet um, and um, he said, um, these are the times that try men and women's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will shrink at this moment from the service of their cause in their country. But everyone that stands with us now will win the love and the favor and the affection of every man and every woman for all time. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, but we have this saving consolation. The more difficult the struggle, the more glorious in the end will be our victory. So let's make that victory ours in 2023. Congressman Jamie Raskin. <laughs> One second. Peace. I just want to say thank you to Congressman Raskin. He is author of the new book, Unthinkable Trauma, Truth, and the Trials of American Democracy. It's available here and everywhere else books are sold. We'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live, and a lot of participation in here. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's effort in making both virtual and in-person programming possible, you can visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really grateful to you.